Hey, it's Gpaw here. Hello to the Beauty and Code Conference. I really wanted to be there with you this weekend, but it's just not possible. So I decided to turn my talk into a video to at least give us some sort of consolation prize. Before we start, I want to offer a couple of words of thanks. First and foremost, thank you all for coming out. It means the world to your speakers, you know, that you're out there in the trade, that you're wanting to hear new ideas, wanting to hear us share them. So thank you very much. I understand my friend Alistair Coburn is going to be standing in for me today, and I want to thank him for that. I'm sure he'll do a terrific job, as he always does. I also want to thank the folks at Living IT for inviting me in the first place and for generally setting up what looks like a really excellent venue and agenda for us. I watched all of last year's talks, and I'm sure I'll want to watch this year, too. Finally, I want to give a special shout out to my new friend, Martin Stenland. It was Martin that I had to give my very late emergency cancellation to. And I have to tell you, I could not have asked for anyone to be a more graceful or gracious responder. He even invited me already to come and speak in 2021. And believe me, I'll be there. Organizing conferences is really hard work, and I threw him a major monkey wrench at the last minute. But he rose to the occasion, and I thank Martin from the bottom of my heart. Okay, let's get to it, shall we? My name is G. Paw Hill, and I am a professional change harvester specializing in the software trade. G. Paw is short for grandfather, and I became a G. Paw at the comically young age of just 31. That's how I got my name. But it's a real name. It's what my friends call me, my family, the whole trade, really. If you're wondering, being G-Paw to all those kids, now over a dozen, that's the best career choice I've ever made. The second best career choice? Well, I became a programmer way back in 1980, right at the beginning of the personal computer revolution. And that launched me on over four decades in the geek trades. In that time, I've taken on a lot of different roles. And I still do. As a programmer, I help change code. As a maker coach, I help change how teams work. And as a consultant, I help change how whole organizations, and sometimes even their hosting enterprises, go through their business. At whatever level I'm operating though, what I'm really doing is this. I am helping people harvest the value of the changes they make, then use that value to make more changes that themselves can be harvested for value. It's change, harvest, change, harvest, change, harvest. All day long, every day, in code, in individuals, in teams, in organizations, and in enterprises. The name of this talk is Changing, Changing Software. My mission today is to cover the why, the how, and the what of change harvesting in the software business. Let's start with the why. Changing, Changing Software is a kind of funny name, isn't it? Programming computers is changing software. Our entire trade is, at bottom, the business of changing software. Seen from the outside, the geek trades are going great. There are about 25 million programmers in the world. That number's been doubling every five years or so, for a long time, for almost as long as I've been in the game. Of course, the trade isn't just the direct makers. There are lots of roles, and the number of people who are in the trade is probably closer to something like 200 million people. That number's been growing at the same rate, doubling every five years. Software is everywhere. It's in your computer, sure, but it's also in your phone, your car, your fridge, your piano. It's everywhere. And the result of that is that we all work in a trillion dollar a year industry. So the trade's really going terrific, yeah? Well, yeah, until you look close until you ask those people how their work is going. And once you do that, you know what? You can't help but come away with a profound sense of unhappiness. Executives in the boardroom, they feel they pour more money into software every year and get less value every time. Makers down on the floor, they feel the essential joy of making has been leached right out of them. Customers wait and wait and wait, or they move on. Operations people get nervous rashes from the sound of a beeper going off. When I look at all this, all these people changing software and their unhappiness with their situation, I say to myself, 
Well, we ought to change the trade. We ought to change this. But I'm not talking about changing software, being programmers. I'm talking about changing how we change software. And that is the why of changing, changing software. This talk is about making changes and harvesting their value. Not just down in the code, but all up and down the business, in all the corners and niches and specialties that make up the software trade. Before we go any further, I want to tell you a little bit about something called a dynamic unity, because seeing our systems as dynamic unities is the beginning of being a change harvester. Dynamic unity. Two words in that phrase. Let's look at both. When we say unity, we name a whole thing. It's got a boundary, an inside, and an outside. It might be made up of other unities, and it might have some parts that move from inside to outside. But still, we can see it as one thing. Dynamic means changing. If we describe a process or a thing as, as dynamic, we mean it changes a lot. All the time, really. Uh, put those two words together and we get a dynamic unity. From one point of view, it's a whole stable thing. From another point of view, usually when we take a look at it a little more closely, it's undergoing more or less constant change. That's weird, isn't it? We need an example, a really good one, of a dynamic unity. Fortunately, we've got one. And you actually know it extremely well. I dare say you're even intimate with it, though you may not think of it this way just yet. The nearest dynamic unity? There. Right there. Because you are the nearest dynamic unity. You probably think of yourself as the same person you were yesterday. If we say roughly the same, you think of yourself as roughly the same person you were five years ago or 20 or the day you were born. I mean, you're all the same person, right? You think so, your friends think so, your family does, we all do. That's the unity. Except you're not. At the microscopic level, you know, you're made up of cells. And I have to tell you, 99.9% .9 of the cells you were born with are long gone. And 99.9% .9 of the cells you have right now are less than 10 years old. That's an amazing thing down at the microscopic level. But it actually holds true even as we zoom out. There are larger scale parts and larger scale processes that work very differently at different times in our lives. And I'm not just talking here about degradation of function, the way your eyes or ears don't work quite as well as they used to. I'm talking about entirely different form and function. Your body changes in cycles, little repeated circles like your heartbeat and your circadian rhythm. It also changes in sequences, long one-off changes that have a beginning and a middle and an end. Probably the sequence you'll remember best, if maybe a little embarrassingly, is puberty. And if you can recall that, you know, that particular sequence changed everything. And these changes in your body, both cyclical and sequential, go on throughout your entire life at different levels and at different times to different beats. Then, of course, there's your mind. We don't really know what a mind is, but we all agree it rides in and around a particular part of our bodies, the brain. And your brain changes just like the rest of your body, nonstop. It changes in cycles and in sequences, just like the rest of you. And like the rest of you, it is dramatically different in form and function at different times in your life. So you think of yourself, even with all of this, as the same you. I'm the same thing I was yesterday. But what? What's the same? Almost nothing is the same because almost everything is under continuous change. So what's all that change doing for us anyway? Here's what all that change is doing. All that change is supporting all that change. Each change, cycle or sequence doesn't matter here, is the system enabling or triggering the next change. And this is what a dynamic unity is. It's an engine that makes a change, harvests some value from that change, and uses that value to make another change. Over and over again until the day the change stops. That day, by the way, is the day the dynamic unity dies. Now, take this idea of a dynamic unity and raise its scale. 
Not only is your body a dynamic entity, but so is your organization. It makes a change, it harvests some value, and it uses that value to make another change. The change harvester sees you, your team, your process, your structure, your project, all of these as dynamic unities. Now, armed with this notion of a dynamic unity, this, this is the point where you're expecting me to talk about what we're going to change. We will be talking about that for sure, but not just yet. Instead, I want to talk about how we're going to change. Let me tell you about my imaginary friend, Alice. Alice works in the software trade. She's, she's middle, neither in the boardroom nor down on the floor. When Alice closes her eyes, she has a vision of a bright, shining city on a hill. It's perfect there. The perfect makers in the perfect team of the perfect department of a perfect company, all working on the perfect project for the perfect customer in the perfect way. Alice's city on the hill is perfect. Then Alice opens her eyes and what she sees, well, it isn't the city on a hill. No, it's, it's South Crap Town, frankly. But, you know, Alice isn't daunted. She's going to change all that. She's going to turn South Crap Town into the city on the hill. And her approach to this change looks like this. It's going to be procedural. Alice is going to change the rules. There will be new methods, new meetings, new documents, new artifacts. She's envisioning a kind of machine with people as the parts, and it's the procedures that are going to change. And it's going to be global. Crap Town's different in a whole lot of ways from the city on the hill, and Alice is going to change it all starting today. She's very precisely targeted to. Her change is aimed in a straight line towards the distant target. Her approach sees that target as a finish line, and she wants the straightest and most direct possible path to it because there's no value until she crosses that line. Her approach is also given. Alice knows the answer. Naturally, she's going to give it to her team. They're going to take her finished answer and do it. And if they don't, well, she'll figure out how to make them do it. And her change is final. Well, I mean, it would be, right? Because remember, the city on the hill is perfect. Once we get there, there's nothing left to change. So Alice's change will be the last change that we make. So Alice is going to change things. And her change is procedural, global, precisely targeted, given, and final. It's also almost certainly going to fail. Alice, my imaginary friend, we need to talk. That approach to the how, specifically those five properties, is almost exactly the wrong way to go about changing the kind of complex adaptive systems that make up a dynamic unity. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot more time on Alice, but I wanted you to hear those five adjectives because now I want to show you the how of the change harvesting approach. For each of those five adjectives, let's try an alternative. Whatever it is we're going to change, we want to approach that change. We want our how to be human, local, oriented, taken, and iterative. Let's look at each one of those in a little more depth. First up is human. We want the manner in which we change our system to be relentlessly focused on the humans in those systems. We want to lean in towards all the normal human strengths, and we want to lean out away from the normal human weaknesses. The factors we're leaning towards or away from include aspects of a given individual, the group, the culture, and the species. I don't draw the usual mind-body line, but if you do, add in that both physical and mental domains are relevant. What kind of attributes are we talking about? Well, the most obvious attribute of a human is the incredible richness of their social interaction and their equally remarkable sensitivity to it. We are really good at navigating the complexities of ongoing, direct, peer-to-peer -peer discourse with each other. And what I mean by that is uh, something like just you and, and two or three friends in conversation. 
all participating as they see fit, no one in charge, no one forced to speak, no one forced to silence. You may think of yourself as an introvert, I do, or as a misfit weirdo, I do, or just barely passing as normal, I do. So it may be hard to think of yourself as a social creature, but you are, believe me. Approaches to change, or, or changes themselves, that involve plenty of ongoing peer-to-peer -peer social interaction are far more likely to be successful. Those that minimize direct social interaction are much less likely to be successful. Another attribute of humans we lean into, the way our minds work, in particular, the limits of mental bandwidth. And, and the special techniques that humans use to work around those limits. There are others, uh, rapid visual survey, which I usually just call scanning, and a really important one, high responsiveness to rhythm, alternating periods of tension and release. Now, the other adjectives, local, oriented, taken, and iterative, are all going to both reinforce and extend this first one, human. Why? What is our explanation for why this, this first attribute, the extent to which our changes lean into the human, so important? We focus first on the human for the simple reason that in mixed systems involving humans, machines, and procedures, it is the humans that most powerfully determine success or failure. Human beings eat machines and procedures for breakfast. We can break any system that relies on us. We can also save any system that relies on us. We routinely do this every day in myriad ways. Machines are powerful. Procedures are powerful. We humans ought to know we're the ones who made them. We are super powerful compared to them. If we ignore the human or actively lean away from the human, our systems are doomed to failure. So let's move from human to local. When we say we want our changes to be local, we're saying we want our changes to be within reach in, in multiple dimensions. Think of locality as something like neighborhood. We want our changes to be in the neighborhood of our minds, in the neighborhood of our current situation, in the neighborhood of our ability, and in the neighborhood of now. That's what locality is about, nearness and implicitly size. In fact, a very good working understanding of locality can come from repeating this simple mantra. No, smaller. We say, what is the smallest possible change that will have a detectable outcome? Why is locality such a big factor in the success or failure of making changes? Simply put, because it's so much easier. Locality might almost be a synonym for easy. It's easier to see what isn't working now. It's easier to imagine an improvement. It's easier to actually do the imagined change. It's easier to detect the outcome. Finally, here we go back to the human for a second. It is far easier for humans to absorb local changes than it is for them to handle global ones. And now we come to oriented. If our changes are gonna be local, how are we gonna to get to a far away goal? Locality says, find the smallest, easiest, nearest change with detectable outcome and make it. But this gives us a puzzle. There are often a lot of such changes. How do we decide between them? The Change Harvesters Oriented says, turn to face your non-local goal and grab any change that doesn't make it further away. Don't spend a lot of cycles deciding which change aims precisely Take anything that's not definitely wrong and do it. Goals that are outside what we can do in one step, non-local goals, live out there on the horizon. The change harvester orients herself towards the horizon and then acts without much fuss. And that's what that word oriented means. A fundamental idea in all this is act, then look. Take a step, any step that we're sure isn't backwards then look around and choose another one. Why is orientation so important? The way the trade decides on steps is not oriented. It, it, it's very precisely aimed. The precision aiming approach starts with a far away target, defining that target as rigorously as possible. It plots the most direct possible path. 
optimizes that path and then decides how much it's going to cost. It then stores up enough value to cover that cost, to fuel the effort that it will take to get there. This approach ignores a key factor that orientation takes into account, multivalence. The math of precision aiming is always based on a singular type of value. The change and its path are evaluated in terms of the predicted value, one kind, of the finish line out there on the horizon. In a dynamic unity, though, there are lots of different kinds of value in play. In fact, every completed change yields three kinds of value every single time, and hopefully four, and sometimes more. First, when we finish a change, if that, makes, if that change makes things better, even a little bit, that is value right there. Changes that make things better compound like interest. They start delivering their value as soon as they're done, and, and that contributed value greatly affects what will come after. Second, when we finish a change, we get the value of rhythm. The period of making a change is a period of tension or compression. The moment the change is done, that is the corresponding release. Rhythm is just that, tension and release, and it provides a powerful value for the humans in our systems. Third, most importantly, when we finish a change, we get the chance to steer. We get, we get an opportunity to change our minds, change our predictions, change our next step. In the precision aiming approach, we don't get that chance. We're locked in. We're, we've invested enough value to get to this point, but we won't be getting any value back until we cross the finish line. The actual curve that correlates aiming accuracy to target distance is not a straight line. It has a sharp knee or bend. As the target distance gets further away, it first degrades slowly, and then suddenly and sharply, it nosedives. The standard model in the trade greatly overestimates the location of that knee, holding that we can aim a month, a quarter, even a year out with only modest degradation in our accuracy. In complex adaptive systems, this is simply put, nonsense. We'll, we'll pull that into sharper focus when we get to iteration. The oriented approach says find any human focused local change that has a detectable outcome and execute it. It's an approach of act then look and it is as effective in coding as it is in peopling, as it is in teaming, as it is in organizing. At this point, I'm hoping you're starting to feel a sense of weight here, a thickening of the change harvesting conceptual cluster. Now we turn our attention to Taken. Taken has several layers of meaning to the change harvester, but think of it like this. To get to there, we want to start from, work with, adjust, and nurture what we have right here. Taken versus given was a difficult word choice. I also considered pulled versus pushed and morphed versus forced. Those other framings should give you a little bit of a clue. Let's talk about greenfield and brownfield. In the early days of a coding project, you know, everything is new. We're working with a blank page and our creation act is almost entirely about adding to that page. One has tremendous range of motion, the freedom to spitball, to, to write whatever we want, however we want it. We call that greenfield development. In fairly short order though, our project thickens with new capabilities, different but related tasks, additional data sets, and so on. The page isn't blank anymore, and everything we add to it must still fit with and connect to what we already have. That's brownfield development. One of the weaknesses, by the way, of our software pedagogy is how exclusively it focuses on greenfield, given that the overwhelming majority of a project life cycle is actually brownfield work. As the project transitions from green to brown, our techniques change and our vision has to change. What's there now goes in surprisingly short order from relatively insignificant to tremendously important. One of the dominant terms in our productivity function. Eventually, of course, we approach legacy 
where what's there now has so much importance, we can barely add function at all. The cross connections, the tacit knowledge, the tight coupling, so on and so forth, they restrict our range of motion so much we often consider throwing it all away and starting over. Now, take that idea from code and cross it over into a true dynamic unity, yourself or your team or your organization, and you begin to understand the importance of taken, pulled, morphed. Why does this matter? Why don't we just start over with a new blank page? The answer is straightforward, because what we have there now has both vested and ongoing value. And losing either of those would cost us a lot, often significantly more than the new value we hope to add. Code we've shipped for a year is already making value. It's already handling exceptional situations. It's already satisfying some of our base. It represents a huge amount of domain knowledge, both explicit and tacit. We want more value to be sure, but we don't want to lose what we have. Our complex adaptive system of people and procedures and machines is already shipping. Unlike our code, our software development team shipped on day one and it has never stopped doing so. It already has both vested and ongoing value. Because of the humans in that system, two aspects from the code world are particularly heightened. One, the tacit knowledge in that system dwarfs the explicit knowledge. And two, the cost of erasing what is already there is so high it's virtually guaranteed to swamp any value that we gain. So at this layer of meaning, taken means working closely with what's already there. It's an attitude, an approach. It implies being familiar with what's already there. It implies gradualism, sustainability, and it fits well with the other four terms in the Change Harvester's arsenal. Finally, let's do iterative. The word means repeating. And in this context, it means that the changes we make will be repeated. We will make a change, see what happens, and make another change. We will conceive, consider, and execute each change we make in the full and firm knowledge that really, it's just a single crank of the wheel. Never final, only the next place from which to move. And I want to make this clear, we are fully aware and fully embrace the idea that we will very likely be changing things we have already changed. The most direct and obvious consequence of this stance, if everything is subject to change, we want everything to be as easy to change as is possible. And we want to develop the various behaviors and habits that make change easy. But there's a second and also really important consequence. In existing practice, we focus all our attention on what we predict to be the final outcome of our change. We make predictions about how our systems will respond to a change and then optimize our decisions and behaviors accordingly. The existing trade believes in something called linear error epsilon in predictability. Okay, that's a mouthful, but what it means is actually pretty simple. It means the better our input at the start, the better our prediction will be at the end. Less accurate input gives less accurate prediction and more accurate input gives more accurate prediction. And that means, hey, we can tune our changes in advance very carefully, then optimize their implementation so that we get just the outcome we wanted. Here's the thing. That basic premise, more accurate input means more accurate output, is not a valid premise when the system we're changing is a complex adaptive system, when it's a dynamic unity. In fact, the falseness of that idea is practically speaking, the defining attribute of complex adaptive systems. Now you see the second consequence. Working iteratively succeeds even when our predictions aren't perfect. In existing practice, you get one try. When we're only allowing ourselves one try, one pass at a change, we have to be right. Organizations often suggest that failed prediction is a matter of not trying hard enough. That's not the case. This is not mystical and it's strictly mathematical. The study of nonlinear dynamics, sometimes called chaos theory, nowadays we usually call it complexity theory, 
virtually guarantees unpredictability out beyond an extremely short distance to our target. And that is why we iterate. We make a change, we wait for the system to react, and we make another change, very possibly in exactly the same area we just changed. The heart of the iterative approach is assuming change. We embrace it, we plan for it, we expect it, we encourage it, we enjoy it. We see it as the central act that defines what we are and what we do. When we're iterative in our approach, the stakes are dramatically lower. We don't have to be right. We, we just have to be not terribly wrong. This lets us dispense with an extraordinary cost, one we mentioned when we spoke up there about orientation, the cost of trying and failing to predict reactions in advance. So we got human, local, oriented, taken, and iterative. This is the how of change. Let's wrap up our understanding of this by a practical application of it. A little more than 20 years ago, back in the late 90s, I was a very early adopter of extreme programming. XP. XP has been through some changes in those years, but three pillars of XP practice, tremendously successful and used, well, not universally, but certainly in lots of domains and lots of software shops around the world, were these. Working by story, developing using TDD and refactoring, and performing large amounts of work in pairs. Do you know why they're successful? Because they align. In the domain of changing software, with exactly the five words we've been talking about. When we work by story, we tackle one vertical problem at a time. We're taking a single point on the surface of our program, extending it from pixels to bits and tackling just that problem. This is locality. We're shrinking our problem as small as we can shrink it for two primary reasons, to support the human limits on mental bandwidth and to reach value, even partial value, more quickly. We even go so far as to make the process iterative, to keep our stories local. We will arrange how we apply them to our program, knowing full well that when the next story comes along, the code we wrote for that first one will likely have to change. The tightly coupled practices of TDD and refactoring manifest most of these five words. In TDD, we work by first imagining a small change then making a test that runs and fails because the change isn't there yet. Then we put our change in, making that test and all the other tests run and pass. We then redesign the code to our best understanding of what excellent code means. Finally, we push the tests and the code to our repository. We call this red, green, refactor, push. And we run that sequence over and over many times a day, taking somewhere between hmm, 10 and 45 minutes each time we do it. TDD relates to the human in several ways, but let's name two of them. First, the tasks that it presents to the human are right in the sweet spot of human mental bandwidth. A typical sequence of the four steps at each step lets our human focus on fewer than a dozen lightly related things. This is perfect for mental bandwidth. Second, there's the rhythm of TDD. The process works by modest stretches of tension from the time we write that red test to the time we push our code, which then releases the tension. We have tons of data saying that this is the most productive way for humans to work, alternating stretches of tension punctuated with brief periods of release. That whole last little bit before we push the refactoring it's incredibly human in its intent and is a perfect instance of taken. We keep changing the code even after we pass all the tests until the design of that code is excellent. We name things to give ourselves handles for strong chunking. We move things to group them together in ways that make sense to us. We work to amplify the signal in our code and suppress the noise. Notice, we're not doing a single one of those things to let the computer use the code. It's already using it just fine. No, we're doing all of that for the human. As for taken, well, that should be clear to you. 100% of refactoring is about working with code that is already there. Of course, TDD is micro-local and is therefore an oriented process, and it's iterative, 
Same way working by stories is only at a lower level. Each test we write forces changes in the code and each change is not just likely, but very likely to change code we've already written. Finally, what about pairing? Pair programming has morphed quite a bit in the last two decades. Sometimes we use mobbing with groups larger than just two people. Either way, we're taking advantage of the extraordinary capacity humans have for direct peer-to-peer -peer social interaction. We're leaning in. So now you have a feel for how these change harvesting ideas apply when we're using the old line XP practice. But you know, that's just programming. That's just changing software. I want you to lift the ideas out of changing software, raise them up to the meta level, and think about how we can apply them to changing changing software. We will select changes by orienting rather than precision targeting, simply by turning to face the general direction of our goal. We will make our selections small and well situated within the local context where they take effect. We'll take the stuff of those changes from what is already there, especially the people who are already there. We will focus our closest attention on the humans in our mixed systems of people and procedures and machines. And we will assume each change we enact is just a single turn of the wheel and accept we're likely to change again things we have already changed before. And that is the how of changing, changing software. Oh boy, look, we're nearly out of time here and we've done the why and the how of change, but we haven't done the what. We have an expression in English, putting the cart before the horse. Horses pull wagons, they don't push them. So you wanna put the horse in front and the cart in back. And putting the cart before the horse means arranging our ideas in the wrong order. I've said that we clearly need to change changing software. We have to fix this trade that looks so healthy from the outside and so ill from the inside. And now we spent the last half an hour talking not about what we're gonna change, but about how. So did we put the cart before the horse? No. This is the fundamental message of this talk. The cart is the horse. The horse is the cart. What we are going to change is how we are going to change. Look, there are a lot of changes we need to make in this trade. A lot of decisions, a lot of action, a lot of effort. We could easily spend not just this talk, but the whole day, the whole week, the whole year, just listing all the what's. But the most important what that we need to change is the how we do the changing. The how and the what are not really separable at all. We need them both. And sadly, too much of our trade is obsessed with the what and ignores the how. And that's why we spent all our time today on the how. Let's change this. Let's change changing software so that we understand it as a dynamic unity that is making a change, harvesting its value, and using that value to make the next change. Human, local, oriented, taken, and iterative. That is the change harvesting approach. Using these ideas, we can help change code. We can help ourselves change as individuals and as teams. We can change programs and products and process. We form a dynamic unity. And in fact, the only thing that is guaranteed to stay the same about us is that we're continuing to harvest the value of change. Every day, all the time, world without end. We can change changing software. And when we're done, well, we can change the world. I'm G-Paw. Thanks for watching.